asked our next guest to come up here, and he's going to just amaze you because he's an amazing human being, Mr. William Schufeld. You're awesome, brother. Thank you, man. All right, you guys can hear me? We're good? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so just in terms of a little bit of background about what I want to talk today, what I want all of you to hopefully be able to take away from this is for the past two and a half years, my goal has really been to nail in the easiest and most simple and effective approach to get lean, strong, and to just have tons of energy all day. So those have always been kind of the three criteria by which I judge how is my progress going. Um, I, I really got burnt out on tracking, on meticulous you know, finger pricking and metrics and just all of the obsessive nature of diet a while ago. And I decided, you know what? I want to listen to my body and I want to find something that actually works for me that I can just intuitively use. So that is what we're going to be talking about today. And the reason I subtitled this goal-oriented keto is that I think a lot of us come to this diet with very simple goals in mind. We either want to drop fat, we want to build muscle, but along the way, we get lost in this sea of podcasts and in this sea of blog posts and articles and this expert said this, but this one said that, and now I need to start taking this and that. And, and it's just like you start piling rules and rules and rules on top of yourself, and then you get to a point where you actually lose track of the initial goal that you were aiming for. So what I want to do is I just want us all to narrow in to be aware of what our goals are and then to go for those. So if your goal is to get a little bit leaner, a little bit stronger, and to have a bunch of energy, this talk is for you. Okay, so a little background on who I am, what I've done. Um, so a couple years back, I was heavy into the acting game. Um, that was kind of my passion in life. And this was coming from an economics degree, so I had no acting experience, but I set a crazy goal for myself. And um, I really pushed myself my last year in college to really go for the acting dream that I had. So I did a bunch of stuff, and eventually by the end of the year, um, I had booked this role on Power Rangers, which was really life-changing. And to me, my main takeaway from that was that if you set a goal for yourself and you actually break it down, you chunk it all the way down to the point where you have monthly, weekly, daily, minute by minute things that you need to be doing, and you're checking those boxes off every single day, you're getting up early, you're working as hard as you possibly can, you can achieve crazy things within a year sometimes. Um, so that was, that was something that was huge for me, that experience. Um, I do the Better, Stronger, Faster podcast with co-host Chris Bell, who is awesome. Um, that's another one of those awesome just kind of things that I have to sit back and reflect on sometimes. I was watching Chris Bell's documentaries like uh, Bigger, Stronger, Faster back when I was in high school. So that's been a huge pleasure. I've got my own podcast, the Will to Win podcast, where we get into a lot of keto, a lot of carnivore, a lot of daily routines, morning routines, kind of lifestyle hacks, things that have worked for me over the years, um, as well as just a lot of business mindset, talking about books, things like that. Um, and then Primal Body, these are the brand of keto carnivore programs where I help people out with muscle building, fat loss, things like that. So that is what I'm up to currently. Now, here's kind of where my whole health journey began. That's a beautiful picture. All right, so the, the kid on the left had all of the same dreams as that guy on the right, all of the same confidence, the exact same guy, but I felt severely limited by my appearance and by my energy overall. So the one thing I would always deal with is, you know, you go to talk to someone and then they're, they're staring at your face and all of a sudden you can't make eye contact with them. And I got to this point where I remember after church on Sundays, I would actually avoid everyone and run straight to the car so I wouldn't have to talk to anybody. So that sort of thing takes a huge impact on your personality overall, but just your confidence in general. And the reason I really promote health is because if you want to accomplish your dreams, if you want to go after things that are, you're passionate about, you need to reclaim your health. That's the first thing. If, if you're lacking energy, if, you are not op, if you're not performing at your peak every single day, it just makes life exponentially difficult. So this kid started getting really, really obsessed with diet, nutrition, fitness, um, and I just studied it relentlessly. It was really a hobby for me. So the first thing I tried was a whole foods plant-based diet. I did that for over three years, 
And uh, it did take care of my skin, but there were some unfortunate side effects of that. Um, I had a ton of bloating. I had a lot of gut issues. My stomach was consistently upset. No matter how much I ate on that diet, I was never satisfied. I could get up to the point where I was eating maybe 3,000 calories a day. I would still be hungry at the end of the day, even if my stomach was just bloated out to here. So I realized immediately that there's something wrong with this. I, I shouldn't have to eat every 30 minutes. I shouldn't have to, you know, oh crap, it's been two hours and now I'm super hungry and I need to run back for a snack. So I wanted something where I could just focus on what I'm doing and I could feel satiated and energized throughout the day. Um, three years ago, actually I was, I was one season into acting in Power Rangers and I was still vegan and I just hit this wall where <laughs> the red Power Ranger had no energy, uh, did not feel good at all and I had three weeks in between seasons, between season one and season two. So in that three weeks, I just started researching keto and I was watching a lot of YouTube videos, I was reading a lot of blog posts and I just decided to make a complete 180 to try keto. I didn't ease into it. Um, you know, I got hit with that keto flu and it actually really, really helped me going into that second season. I dropped a good amount of water weight. I started dropping body fat. I had a ton of energy all day and things were just really improving for me. So that's sort of the progression of the guy on the left to the guy on the right. Now on the left was when I started keto and I was basically eating fat to satiety. I would moderate my protein. I would keep myself usually probably at about 80 to 100 grams of protein a day. Um, and I would eat fat to satiety. I was drinking butter. I was, you know, pouring everything with olive oil. Like I was just including a lot of fat in my diet. Um, and what really changed for me was actually when I started reading a lot of Ted Naiman's content and I started experimenting a little bit with protein to energy ratio, upping your protein a bit, moderating the fat, and then obviously keeping the carbs low, my physique changed a lot and in a short amount of time too. So um, on the right, that is kind of the physique that I'm able to sport year round where it's, it's a lot leaner. I pretty much eat, you know, beef, eggs, fish. Um, I'll incorporate some seafood, some oysters, things like that, some beef liver, uh, some different superfoods, but most of the time it's very high protein, it's moderate fat, and it's low carb. And I found that that's been amazing for my energy. I can keep a very lean physique year round. I can stay strong year round, which is also really important to me. And it just sort of checks off all the boxes for me. Um, so this was kind of the way that I was approaching keto before. Um, I was including a lot of food variety and I was just eating a lot more. I found that for me, fat was not that satiating. I could eat a lot of fat, but it didn't have a huge impact on my satiety. Now, I strongly believe that satiety is driven largely by protein, minerals, nutrients. So if you can target those first, it will naturally, a lot of the time, cause a automatic drop in calories because you're satiated. You fulfilled your body's nutrient requirements. Now, yes, your body also has energy requirements, especially if you're training a lot, if you're very busy. So you still need to fulfill those energy requirements, but it just reduces how much of that you have to overeat to get the protein that you need. So that's why I always kind of prioritize protein. Okay, so this was a simple little list that I put up on Twitter recently. And this is what I'm all about. I want to dumb things down as much as possible for everyone. So eat leanish protein to satiety. Now, how this works for me is I will literally get up in the morning, I train fasted, and then I will wait as long as I can into the day until I eat my first meal. So it's a very intuitive style of fasting. I'm not forcing a 16-8 window, a 24 window. I'm not doing anything like that. I'm listening to my body. At some point during the morning, sometimes early afternoon, you know, I start to feel, okay, I'm getting a little hungry, I'm getting a little low energy, I think it's time for some food, then I'll have my first meal usually at about 11 a.m.-ish. Um, I'm usually getting up at 3 in the morning and training from 3.30 to 5, so the fast continues for a good while after my training. And a lot of people wonder, do you have to eat right after your training? If your goal is to maximize performance, sure, it would probably be beneficial. But if your goal is simply to live a great quality life and to stay lean and to stay strong, it's probably not necessary. And that's, that's why I keep reiterating knowing your goals with this. 
So fasting until true hunger, eating until full satiety has been something that's huge for me. I think that any style of eating in which you artificially restrict yourself, you set a limit and you say, okay, I'm only going to eat up until this limit, regardless of how my body feels, is good for short-term benefits. It's good for short-term weight loss. It can get you to your weight goals. But the issue for that with me is that there's a sort of a compensatory hunger where eventually at some point your hunger is going to come back and you're going to put that weight on slowly. But If you can intuitively eat until you're satiated by prioritizing some of the highest satiety foods, you know, lean-ish protein, um, you know, really prioritizing minerals, then you can honestly get satiated at a lower amount of calories. So that's what I focus on. I really, really do not like to limit how much I'm eating. I think it's really important to listen to your body with that. Don't drink calories. So that one is simple right there. Just You know, I'm sure there are a lot of people in here, don't throw anything at me, I'm sure there's some people in here that like their fatty coffee, that like MCT oil, things like that, and I think there's nothing wrong with that, but just consume those things in moderation, because you are replenishing those fat stores in your body. Yes, MCTs are burned immediately as energy, but why not burn your body fat as energy? So I just kind of like to stick to running off my own body fat in the morning, You know, I I do a a majorly carnivore diet, but I do include black coffee in the morning. So I'll usually have one or two cups of coffee in the morning. Just kind of helps me get through my fast and also helps me out with my training. Optimize the process daily. So this is huge for me. I think when we get trapped in, you know, sort of the web of tracking and listening to experts and listening to all of the different podcasts, we can really lose sight of what's working for us and what's not working for us. And we can just automatically take the expert's diet and their morning routine and everything that's working for them, put it right on top of our life as a template, and then wonder why it's not working for us. Do we lack willpower? What's the issue there? So optimizing the process for yourself daily is huge. It starts with knowing what your goals are. It starts with tracking those daily and writing down, okay, this worked for me today. This didn't work for me today. Optimizing that over time. So here's just a couple sample meals, things that I would eat in a day. I keep it super, super simple. About 80% of my diet is beef. It's red meat. So right on the left, you'll see I've got a bunch of ground beef there. I've got a little bit of eggs on top of that. Um, I think it's actually egg yolks that I put on top of that. And then I've got some bacon on the side. In the upper right was an amazing meal that Brian Sanders made. But it was basically organ meat burger. We've got oysters. We've got whole baby sardines. (laughs) Um, We have got eggs underneath that. There's salmon roe. And then we've also got fresh oysters in there. So if you're trying to go the whole nine yards, that is a very nutrient-dense meal. Fantastic way to eat. I usually try to incorporate those foods throughout the week. I'm not eating like that every single day. Um, Bottom right, really simple meal. Literally cooked up a bunch of ground beef. I've got some Primal Kitchens mustard on that. Um, I'll also take some of the ancestral supplements, adrenals. Sometimes I'll do pasteurized hard-boiled eggs, really, really easy snack. And then I've got some uh, collagen hydrolysate that occasionally I'll add to water and I'll have some of that. So this is basically what the checklist looks like on a daily basis. And remember, the whole goal here is you are trying to get lean and stay lean as easily as possible without forcing yourself to be hungry all the time. So this is what I'm eating basically on a daily basis. If I can check all of these boxes off, that's a good day for me. Um, And remember, I'm not restricting myself with this. Now, a few tips with this. So for beef, um, this is kind of how I optimize that protein to energy ratio. With beef, let's say I'm having a steak, maybe it's a ribeye, maybe it's a New York strip. I will trim a bit of that fat off the side. Now that's kind of anathema to what we're all doing here with keto, fat is fuel but it tends to work for me just in terms of body composition. So I'll trim a bit of that fat off. If I'm doing ground beef, a lot of that fat pools at the bottom of the pan. So I'll usually drain a bit of that before plating it. Um, Eggs, eggs are one of the great fat sources. I would not cut egg yolks at all. They're way too nutrient dense to do that. You're getting folate, you're getting a lot of fat soluble nutrients. So keep those in there for sure. Um, Trying to have about four to five of those a day. They're also fantastic for satiety. I noticed that hard-boiled eggs get you really full fast. So um, if you're also trying to get that natural reduction in calories, that's something else you can consider. Beef liver. So this is one that I'm experimenting with. 
Recently, I've been doing four ounces of beef liver a day. And the reason I'm doing that is because I think beef liver and egg yolks are probably nature's multivitamins. They're probably the most nutrient-dense foods you can get. And I push my body pretty hard every day. So the amazing nutrient content of beef liver with all of the B vitamins, everything that you would take a five-hour energy for, you're going to find a lot of that stuff in beef. Tons of B vitamins, tons of iron, a lot of great nutrients in there. So I try to have some beef liver every day just to support my energy levels and my training and the demand I'm placing on myself. I'm doing about four ounces of that a day, and I'm doing it frozen, and I'm doing it raw. I don't recommend any of this. Um, cook, the beef, cook the beef liver however you would like. A great idea is pan searing it in a little bit of bacon fat. So let's say you, know, you make some bacon. If you can just do a quick sear on each side, it'll be nice and rare on the inside, which preserves, strangely enough, a little sweet taste to the, uh, to the liver. I think it actually tastes great. If you fully cook it all the way through, it gets that chalky sort of grainy taste, and it's kind of, that's where people start to think it tastes gamey or it tastes weird. So that's something that I've done. But recently, there's this whole frozen liver gang going on on, on Instagram, social media. Um, which I've been trying, and it's actually really, really good frozen. It's like a weird popsicle. Um, <laughs> do not recommend that, but it's working for me. And, and the whole idea behind freezing it is to kill off parasites before eating it. So, again, not a doctor. Actor. <laughs> um, if I end up in the hospital after this, you'll know why. Uh, so whole bone calcium. I try to restrict the amount of dairy I'm eating. Really, honestly, because dairy just kind of tends to lead to a little bit of water retention for me. Um, so with the whole goal of staying lean and strong, I do try to restrict the amount of dairy I'm eating. I think a lot of people can have casein allergies sometimes. Um, you could notice this honestly by how you feel when you eat dairy. If it sits in your stomach heavy, if you feel bloated afterwards, if you get swelling in your face or you get dark circles around your eyes, those are sometimes some of the symptoms that people will get uh, when they're not reacting too well to casein. So keep that in mind. You can take casein out for or basically take dairy out for about a month, slowly reincorporate it. If you're going to reincorporate it, I would say opt for fermented dairy. Go for some high quality cottage cheese, some Greek yogurt, maybe some hard cheeses where that lactose has been processed. So it's not gonna be as disruptive to the body. Um, but the whole reason doing whole bone calcium is just to supplement calcium levels a little bit. Hydrolyzed collagen, that is the whole nose to tail movement that is going on right now. Dr. Paul Saladino has done a great job of putting out information about this. But here's the thing. I want to say about whole bone calcium, hydrolyzed collagen, magnesium, these last three that I incorporate, I honestly don't think these are completely necessary. The reason I do these is because I want to hedge my bets. I'm planning to do this diet for the long term. I would love to eat like this until I'm in my 90s or above. Um, so I want to do this diet for the long term, and I do not, you know, want to basically be detrimental to my health just to prove a point. So for me, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure this diet works for me, and that's why I'm sort of including those things as safeguards for myself. Um, the magnesium, just because I've read a lot that magnesium was probably something we got ancestrally from our water sources, um, it can improve sleep quality, it can just help calm you down at the end of the day, so I'll take about one to two teaspoons of Natural Calm from the brand Natural Vitality, and I think it's just a magnesium citrate, so I'll take a little bit of that at night. Yeah, so just running through kind of what a grocery haul looks like for me. There's my magnesium brand. I've got two uh, bottles of ancestral supplements. I like to incorporate those as well, and that's, that's the same thing. It's like, do we know if these are necessary? Does everyone need to go run out and buy these right now? I don't know, that's up to you. But for me, I want to hedge my bets. I want to make sure I'm doing this safe and including just sort of a nose to tail style of eating. And then I've got the hydrolyzed collagen there. I put a lot of salt on my food. I think salt is probably one of the most overlooked things that people really, even in our keto community where you know, we're all about salt, I think people still might not be getting enough salt in during the day. Coffee is depleting salt in the body. Sleep deprivation, exercise, sweating, if you are stressed out about work. Um, there are so many different things that deplete salt in the body. So you w really want to replenish that for your thyroid, for your electrolytes, just to feel good throughout the day. Um, Fasting is another one of those things that depletes salt in the body. So I like to make sure I'm having lots of salt throughout the day. 
And usually in the morning, uh, quick tip right here, the best pre-workout I've ever tried is you have a huge meal the night before. In the morning, you have a cup of black coffee and you take about a teaspoon of salt. I'll take a little more sometimes. This is completely gross, but I will just straight up put it under my tongue, drink it back with water. It's not meant to taste good. It doesn't taste good, but I have amazing workouts after that. The caffeine just really gets my body going. Um, black coffee is just part of my morning routine. And the salt, for me, it really helps with muscle contractions. I feel stronger in the gym. A lot of the reasons that I think people would eat carbs to refill their muscle glycogen and just to feel better, stronger muscle contractions, I feel like I get a lot of that through salt. So I try to incorporate that. Um, and this is honestly the kind of stuff that I would get. I would go to Sprouts. I would get a bunch of their ground beef, which is ridiculously cheap. It's literally sometimes $2.99 a pound. Um, I will grab some of the pasture-raised eggs. I will get some Wild Planet sardines. Um, I've also got some, I think, kipper in there, and I've got some canned salmon. Uh, above, you see the calf liver, so that's the brand I'm usually getting that's also from Sprouts. And then we've got some seafood on the side there. Now, this is something, when I first saw this graph, I thought it was super interesting because it aligned with a lot of the things I had studied about diet and fat loss. Basically, it shows that the lowest ad lib energy intake, so caloric intake, often occurs when you are consuming 50% of your daily calories from protein, high amount of protein. That's a lot of protein. Think about protein is four calories per gram. So if you're eating 50% of your daily calories from protein, that's a lot of protein. 40% um, from fat, 10% from carbs. Now, let's just fully think about this here. This is almost a protein-sparing modified fast. So a lot of people will see this and they'll say, okay, you're eating so much protein, you can't run off of protein, it's a building block, it's not a fuel source, and I 100% agree. I think that is the benefit of protein, is that it's not really a fuel source. It is metabolically costly for your body to use protein as a fuel source. So it's going to cause you to burn through a little bit more fat, but you do not want to stay at a super low level of fat and a super high level of protein all the time. It's gonna be very uncomfortable for your body. You're gonna feel bad over time. So it's something that you can incorporate for short amounts of time and then you up the fat a little bit. It's gonna help out with your hormones. It's just gonna reset your body. So when you're approaching your diet like this, um, you do wanna consider it in moderation. You know, if you're eating tuna and lean ground beef and you're eating, I don't know, skinless, boneless chicken breast, you are gonna feel really bad pretty soon. Yes, you'll drop some weight, you'll drop some water weight, but eventually you'll need to reincorporate some fats just to keep your body happy. Um, something I wanted to incorporate really quickly was what, some of the guys that I really looked to just for sort of an intuitive approach to training and staying in shape was this golden era of bodybuilders, and this was in the 1970s. So literally, Arnold Schwarzenegger and his whole gang, Franco Colombo, Frank Zane, all of these great bodybuilders in the 70s, they had awesome physiques. They were lean, they looked athletic, they didn't look like these humongous, massive dudes you see nowadays. Um, and the diet they were eating was literally almost a carnivore diet, which is, it surprised me. Uh, Chris and I, actually, we had Rick Drayson, who was one of the guys that was training with Arnold back in the day. We had him on the podcast. And he told us, okay, so we literally all, all week, we would be eating beef, eggs, cottage cheese. We would have maybe a tuna fish omelet. Um, sometimes we would have a little bit of heavy cream for some extra fat in the diet. But most of the time it was really high protein and really low carb. And they stayed lean year round. They did not track portions. They did not track calories. And they were able to train two hours a day, three hours a day on this sort of diet. So I thought that was really, really interesting because they were way ahead of their time with this kind of stuff. There was no science coming out around ketosis, um, but they just kind of intuitively knew if you want to drop fat, you cut the carbs. If you want to stay strong and build muscle, you keep your protein up there, keep just enough fat. And the one thing they did that I actually found really interesting is they would incorporate a weekly cheat day. Um, so it was, from what Rick Drayson told us, it was literally anything would go. Uh, house of pies, whatever, <laughs> they were eating a lot. But keep in mind, these guys were training very glycolytic exercise every single day. So they were lifting weights just about every day. They were burning through muscle glycogen. So on that cheat day, it may have honestly helped them out with their testosterone levels a little bit. It may have dropped their cortisol a little bit and just helped them relax. 
So for those of us that aren't training, you know, two sessions a day, two hours per session, um, and just going super ham like that, you know, maybe we don't need to be doing that weekly cheat day. Um, or maybe once you've hit your body fat goals, then you can start to incorporate a little bit of carbs if you want to. But I don't think it's necessary at all. So a few more examples of the kind of things I would eat. Um, upper right, this is at Whole Foods. I grab a bit of their chicken. I grab, uh, I guess that also counts as chicken, some of their eggs. Um, and then at the bottom, I've got their, I think that was a bone and ribeye. And I like to put Primal Kitchen steak sauce on this. It's absolutely delicious. It's mostly vinegar based, so there's not really any, uh, not many calories in that. Um, bunch of Redmond's real salt. On the left, that's something that I would eat if I was going to eat out. So I would get eggs. I would ask them, hey, can I get a side of bacon? Can I maybe grab some sausage on the side as well? And that's how you can make it work for you when you're eating out. I've gotten to the point where I don't even choose items that are on the menu. I will just ask them, hey, like how much would it be for two burger patties and some eggs or something like that? And they have to figure out how they want to price it. But um, a lot of the time it's a lot cheaper than you'd expect because there's literally nothing else with it. Okay, so love this graphic. Um, five steps to fat loss, replace carbs with protein. Every other step is just focusing on dialing that in. There's more to it than that, but if you can focus on that first, before you start trying to optimize your fasting window, before you start trying to have the perfect form of high intensity interval cardio, you know, the perfect workout routine, you know, I have to manage my circadian rhythms, I need to ensure that I'm supplementing everything. If you just take care of the 20% of things that will lead to 80% of your results, that whole 80-20 principle, you will save yourself a lot of headaches. There's no point in trying to manage every single aspect of this if eventually you get overwhelmed with all of it and you throw your hands up in the air and you have a cheat day and then you set yourself back a week. So just focusing on that I think will get a lot of people a long way towards their goals. Um, and then this was a post I had put up recently, fast fat loss protocol. So I just listed exactly what I would eat if I had a lot of weight to lose. I would be fasting into the day and then I would be having some lean ground beef steaks with the fat trimmed, I'd have some salmon, whole eggs, liver about twice a week, oysters. Fast until hungry, eat until satiated, rinse and repeat. Um, and then bonuses would be supplementing collagen, whole bone calcium, just to optimize certain areas of your health. Now, Mick is an awesome, awesome guy who I recently interviewed on my podcast. He's been doing carnivore for about 14 months now. He's 60 years old, and on the left, He's basically been a lifelong vegan. He was actually raised as a vegan his entire life. This went all the way up until he was in college, and then he started experimenting with being vegetarian. Then he ate a standard American diet. And then recently he found paleo. Then he found keto. And then for the past 14 months, he's been carnivore. So 14 months ago, and Mick now, and <laughs> this dude is in incredible shape. I, I asked him if I could include him in, in my talk, and he actually sent me a few more pictures that I just got this morning. He's actually more ripped than the picture shows, um, but the guy literally full six pack at 60 years old and he's eating a very similar style of diet, high protein, moderate fat, low carb, carnivore, prioritizing red meat, eggs, seafood, things like that. Uh, he does, I believe it's 15 minutes a day of body weight calisthenics. Um, a lot of you, if you follow Ted Naiman, you'll know he's a big proponent of that. It's really, really effective. Now, a few other people that I look up to for this, um, Brian Sanders, uh, you know, Food Lies director, he has really, really common sense information about this. In a world where we're always pushing the boundaries and trying to maximize everything, I think Brian Sanders has some fantastic common sense information about this. I would also point people to the website meat.health. That's uh, Kevin Stock. Kevin Stock has awesome stuff, a great newsletter as well that's very packed with information. On the upper right, I forget this guy's name, and unfortunately, he recently passed away, but he was in his mid-90s. And I love here where he says, um, I've been on a fat trip lately, fat, piles of fat. He avoids sugar and eats lots of meat. So I guess that runs contrary to my talk, but um, this guy was basically following, you know, a low-carb diet, and he was eating lots and lots of meat, extremely, extremely active into his mid-90s. So I think he's another great example of health, and then Nicole on the bottom right, if you've ever seen her page on Instagram, Healthy with Nicole, came from a long stint of doing a vegan and vegetarian diet, 
had a lot of health issues with that. And she is in fantastic shape and in great health now. So I think for a lot of women wondering, is this something we can do? I think she's a great page that you can follow. So this is my breakfast food pyramid, um, just to make things super easy for everybody. Literally a cup of black coffee. And that's, that's another one of those things where we need to think, okay, caffeine, is it going to ruin my circadian rhythms? Is it going to lead to anxiety? Is it going to lead to this and that? We hear a lot of different things, but think about it. You know, what contributes to your quality of life? For me, I absolutely love getting up in the morning, making a cup of black coffee, sitting down, doing my morning gratitude, going to the gym. I'm all fired up from the coffee. I have a great workout. And then after that, I go sit down. I've got my work for the day, have one more cup of coffee, and then I'm good for the day. So I think sometimes these things in moderation, we need to keep that in mind. We can get worried about, you know, is the polyphenols, is that good for us? Is the caffeic acid good or bad for us? Um, that's something that I think each of us have to decide for ourselves. For me, I'm keeping the coffee. And then really simple, if any of you, you know, want to incorporate the daily exercise, like I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, a few things you could do. This is really inspired by a lot of Ted Naiman's work around these 15-minute daily routines. But you don't have to go to a gym and spend an hour and a half every single day. Sometimes it's better to minimize it and just check the boxes off every day. Build the habit. And then you can start to go, you know, compete in CrossFit and run a marathon. So this is really simple. I would honestly, if I was doing this, I would pick one exercise from each of these categories and just do that for the day. So each of these you would want to be doing one set to failure. I'm talking about the left-hand side, the body weight calisthenics. I would maybe do jump squats. So I would immediately, you know, just hit as many jump squats as I possibly could I might, at the end of this, I might breathe for about five seconds, hit one more little round of jump squats just to get everything out of my legs, get as much work as I can out of them. And then I would probably take, you know, about 15 seconds, 30 seconds, trying not to rest too much. I would jump straight into a pushing movement. If you can't do push-ups, maybe do the push-ups with your knees. If you can't do it with your knees, maybe do it against a chair. If you can't do it against a chair, do it against the wall. But every single day, try to push the boundaries of what you can do. Eventually, you may get to the point where you're doing clapping push-ups, you're doing one-arm push-ups. So there's a progression without even needing to go to the gym. I am running fast on time, and I do want to take at least a couple questions. So I'm going to just leave this up here. Y'all can figure this out. Basically, one set to failure daily of body weight exercises. And then on the right, things that I would like to include within a weekly training pyramid, it would be resistance training. I think that is number one. That is the king. If you really want to optimize your hormones, if you want to optimize your body composition, if you just want to feel stronger in general, take care of your bone health, stave off sarcopenia. So in terms of longevity, resistance training is amazing. That's number one. Number two, incorporate some cardio into your week. Um, you know, whether you're doing aerobic cardio I think that's actually really great for a lot of people. Sometimes all you need to do is go out for a hike, go out for a long walk, brisk walk, take your dogs out for a walk. Sometimes that's all you need to do. If you really want to start maximizing, you know, the afterburn effect and things like that, getting as lean as you can, you can start to incorporate some high intensity cardio. That can be as simple as 15 minutes, you're on the little uh, spin cycle at the gym, you pedal as hard as you can for 30 seconds, you take maybe 30 to 60 seconds to breathe, you pedal again as hard as you can for 30 seconds. That's another one of those things where I'm like, you know, people argue, Tabata, hit, should I do intervals? Should I do sprint intervals? Just do something, <laughs> you know, 15 minutes. Go as hard as you can. For me, my high intensity cardio is I will literally get a basketball and I will shoot for about an hour and I'm pretty much sprinting after any of my missed shots, of which there are many. Um, so I'm doing a lot of sprinting in an hour and it's fun. I didn't have to track anything. I didn't have a watch. You know, I'm not beating myself up to do it. It's really, really fun, and I get a great workout in. And there's lots of jumping as well. Um, and then incorporate some mobility, core work, and flexibility throughout the week. If you don't use it, you lose it. So work your core, stretch, do things like that. It's just a really common sense approach. Um, and then a bonus thing to do, if you could do some saunas, I think that's fantastic. There's plenty of research about the benefits of saunas. Cold showers as well. There are... There are a lot of benefits uh, to cold showers, especially in terms of mental health and, you know, really spiking your dopamine in the morning. If you don't want to do coffee, I think a cold shower would work. Um, but 
I would say one of the best things about cold showers is just developing the skill of making yourself do something that you don't want to do because that's going to carry over into a lot of other areas of life. And doing that kind of stuff in the morning is especially beneficial. And, okay, last couple things that I'm up to. On the left, um, the awesome, awesome Brad Kearns of the Primal Endurance and Primal Blueprint books. Um, we have been teaming up, and also we've got Brian, who is Whole Dudes on Instagram. We've been teaming up to create this carnivore cookbook. Uh, it's going to be really fun. There's a lot of humor in it, a lot of great recipes in it, and also some tips about how to get leaned, how to get healthy, things like that. And then on the right, uh, Dr. Ted Naiman and I have been working for probably about nine, about nine months right now on this book where we are trying to just simplify the entire world of diet, um, make it as simple as possible so that literally anybody at any age could pick this book up, look at the graphics, look at the information, and say, okay, I know what to do. I think I can drop some weight. I think I can get healthy. Um, we don't want to get bogged down in the science and this person recommends this, they recommend that. Just a few simple guidelines that everyone can follow and things get better for them. So uh, that is my talk. Thank you guys. So full disclosure, I see I've got four minutes here. Brian's about to throw me off the stage. So I'm going to try to take your question and... Maybe if we can get a few more in. Yes. So my only question is if you get up at 3 in the morning, what time do you go to bed? Great question. So if I get up at 3 in the morning, what time do I go to bed? Um, this is where all the, the sleep experts will hate me. So I am usually going to bed at about 9 p.m. I try to get in bed earlier if I can. But I find for me, if I want to operate at my best every single day, as long as I get to bed by 9 p.m. and I get at least six hours of sleep, I feel pretty good. Um, and I think there are a few factors that play into that. Probably because I'm young, maybe I've got a little bit of reserve there and I can tough that out. I think, honestly, the carnivore diet has really helped me out with this. I don't feel drowsy. I, I don't deal with a lot of the issues I would, I think, if I had a lot of inflammation in my body. Um, I don't have a lot of excess weight that's kind of tiring me out through the day. So I think, honestly, through diet and exercise, my sleep might be a little more efficient. So I can usually get by on six hours. I do not recommend this. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of great information out there by Matthew Walker, um, by Sean Stevenson about sleep. I think sleep is extremely important. So do not force yourself to sleep deprive. I think that's a really bad idea. Um, if we are all good, then all right. Thank you guys.